Good afternoon. I want to spend today talking about the involvement of viruses in cancer. And in the end, I want you to remember, if you only remember one thing, viruses themselves don't cause cancer. They lead up to cancer. They cause changes in cells that predispose them to cancer. So, a bit of a technicality. But as you'll see today, they don't do the final step. So we're going to talk about transformation in oncogenesis. Oncogenesis is the induction of cancer. Transformation is something different that leads to it. So let's first define what transformation means. We've used transformation in this course to mean the introduction of nucleic acids into cells. A little bit confusing because the other meaning, which is the one here, has been around a lot longer. Here's an experiment. On the upper left, we start with a hamster embryo. We uh, chop it up and digest it with trypsin to make cells out of it. And we plate cells on a dish, a culture dish, and grow them. These cells will grow for a while, as you can see uh, in the graph on the right. But eventually, after 20 or 30 doublings, they'll die. And this is typical of most cells, what we call primary cells that you make from a tissue. If you took some cheek cells from you, you could plate them out. They would grow 20 to 30 times, and then they would die. They are mortal. They don't live forever. However, in this experiment, in some cells, if you just let them grow, a few will survive, and then they will grow and become immortal. Or you can speed up the process by treating these cells with chemicals, mutagenic chemicals, or irradiating them, in which case you will cause them to become transformed and become immortal and live forever. So on the, the little experiment on the left where it took our hamster and plated out cells, we have one plate we haven't treated. These will grow only for a certain time unless we transform the cells in some way. So transformation is changing the ability of cells to grow so that they're now immortal and they have another, a number of other properties associated with them as well. The first is that if you look at them under a microscope, they look very different. On the left at the bottom here is a normal sheet of cells. Uh, these could be primary cells that you've just plated out from a tissue. They look good, they're flat, they touch each other, they stop growing. On the right is a transformed culture of cells. Uh, they tend to keep growing. They don't respect each other's borders. They pile up on one another. And of course, they grow forever. So that's just a morphological difference between normal cells uh, and transformed cells. This period uh, in which they die and new cells reemerge is called crisis here in this experiment. Now, transformed cells have been known for many years in laboratories. And they have a number of interesting properties. We've already looked at the morphology of the cells. And if we look at the side of these cultures, you can see the normal cells, when they touch each other, they stop growing. The transformed cells keep growing, they keep dividing, they pile up and make stacks of cells and so forth. So a number of properties of these cells include they're immortal. They grow indefinitely, like HeLa cells. These were the first immortal cell line isolated from a human. Uh, and they were found to grow forever. They were, turns out they were from a tumor that was already immortal. And that tumor would live forever had it not killed the host, Henrietta Lacks. And I think there's a movie coming out next, next couple of weeks based on the book, uh, which may be interesting. I think the book is probably the better thing to look at. Loss of anchorage dependence. Uh, the cells, when they touch each other, they don't stop growing, but you could also grow transformed cells in agar. You could pour a thick layer of agar into a plate and mix the cells in with it so the cells are suspended and they'll grow. Normal cells won't grow suspended in space. They like to be anchored to a flat surface. Loss of contact inhibition we've talked about. And they have decreased requirements for growth factors. They need less serum than primary cells in order to grow. The reason for this will become apparent in maybe 10 or 15 slides. So that's the property of transformed cells.
So that's transformation. We'll, we're going to talk about how viruses transform cells, but already you should know that you can take a normal cell and transform it by mutagenizing it in some way. The other half of today's lecture title, Oncogenesis, is the development of cancer. And cancer, of course, is a tumor caused, which swells, caused by abnormal growth of tissue. Tumors can be benign, where they're self-contained and the cells don't migrate elsewhere in your body. Um, or they can be malignant, they can metastasize and make small tumors elsewhere, which will eventually, of course, kill you. Cancer is a genetic disease. Even the cancers that you'll see induced by viruses today, it's a genetic disease in the end. There are about 8 million deaths a year uh, from cancer in developed countries. Now, I, I say developed because in underdeveloped or developing countries, there are cancers, but infectious diseases far outnumber cancers. Right? And they have yet to be dealt with in those countries. You need about a dozen mutations in your genome that affect signaling pathways, which we'll talk about today, involved in cell proliferation, survival, determination of cell fate, and maintenance of genome integrity. About a dozen mutations, and boom, the, the cell is going to be cancerous. So this is all about altering the regulatory pathways in us that ensure that most of our cells don't divide all the time. As I said to you earlier when we were talking about viral DNA synthesis, most cells do not divide. Many viruses make them divide because they prefer that. They need it to have the DNA polymerase and so forth available to them. And the pathways that regulate cell division, as well as survival, cell fate, genome integrity, those are the genes that mutate in cancers. And that's why now, whenever someone has a cancer at a medical, major medical center, an academic medical center, we want to sequence it. We put the sequences into a database so we can start to accumulate banks of information about what kinds of genes are mutated in human cancers. And we can see if people are born with six of these, then you're predisposed to some sort of cancer, and we could maybe do something at some point in the future. So you can inherit some of these mutations. They can be caused by DNA damage. If you smoke, smoke contains carcinogens that will accelerate the mutations in your lung cells. Environmental carcinogens, plenty of those being spewed out by uh, manufacturing. And infectious agents, including viruses, which is what we're going to talk about today. Transformation and oncogenesis are two different things. Transformation is changing the properties of cells and culture, all the things we've talked about, including them becoming immortal. But that's not enough to be cancer. You need more mutations, more changes in the cell than occur during transformation. Oncogenesis is the formation of a tumor that requires additional genetic changes. So this animal has a tumor on its back. That tumor started out as a collection of transformed cells that were immortal. And then, here's what happens. When you let cells divide uncontrollably, that is very bad because they begin to accumulate mutations. And every DNA replication cycle, you accumulate mutations in your genome. Some of them are corrected, but some are escape. And if you let cells divide uncontrollably, that is a recipe for formation of a tumor. So the cell gets transformed initially, keeps dividing, dividing, accumulating mutations until you get those magic 12, and then you have a cancer. So cells that divide a lot, like our intestinal epithelial cells, intestinal tumors are quite common uh, because of that. What we understand about the relationship between transformation and oncogenesis, I would argue, is all from studying viruses. It's, they sorted out the whole problem in the end. And what they showed us was that Viruses can transform cells, and it gives them oncogenic potential. Transformed cells divide forever, they accumulate mutations, and they become cancers. No virus can do it all, which means viruses can transform cells, but the cancer arises because the cells keep dividing and accumulate mutations that eventually make them a cancer. Of course, the virus has started this, but the virus itself is not causing uh, the cancer. That is a uh, consequence of repeated genome replications, which is not supposed to happen. So here are uh, viruses involved in human cancers. So they're called human cancer viruses, even though they're just triggering the road on the way to cancer. Epstein-Barr virus, 
Uh, these cancers, Burkitt's lymphoma, nasopharyngeal, and, and others we mentioned last time, hepatitis B and C virus, can liver cancer, uh, human T lymphotropic virus, a retrovirus, leukemia, HIV, many, many different cancers. Because this is a persistent, as we'll see at the end of this course, this is a persistent infection. Your body is always making cytokines. And one of the things that cytokines does is to make cells divide. So you have cytokines around all the time. Cells are always dividing. They get transformed. They get cancerous. Papillomavirus is a variety of cancers. Kaposi's sarcoma, herpes virus, a number of cancers. And Merkel cell polyomavirus, which causes a relatively rare skin cancer. So we think human viruses are the contributing factor in about 20% of human cancers. The rest is genetic and, and environmental. Now the lesson for today is going to be transformation and oncogenesis is not required for the replication of any virus, any with an asterisk. I say this every year in my course, and you'll see for most viruses this is true. They don't need to transform cells. They don't need to cause cancer. But someone wrote me an email, and she works on a virus of fish that causes tumors, and in fact, that's required for spread of the virus. She said, you can't say that to your class anymore that no, for no virus. So later on in, the, in this lecture, I'll tell you about that virus and the fish. But I think still for most viruses, you don't need transformation and oncogenesis. And I think you'll appreciate that uh, by the end today. So today I'm going to tell you this, what I want you to know is a story. This, this is one of the greatest stories in molecular biology. This is, it makes my spine tingle. It makes shivers go up and down my spine. It is so cool. Of course, viruses do anyway, right? Which you may think is morbid, and uh, you can certainly say that. But this is a cool story. So let me tell it to you as a story that begins in 1909. This is something I've mentioned before. Peyton Rouse, downtown. He was working at the Rockefeller Medical Institute, which is what it was called at the time. And uh, rumor has it that farmers would bring him chickens with big tumors on them. And here's, the, here's one of these chickens here with a sarcoma, a solid tissue tumor. And he got interested in this. He was a young physician. He was a doctor. And he wanted to know what was causing this tumor. And it was 1909, not far after viruses had been discovered. And he showed that if, if you took this tumor from the chicken and ground it up and filtered it through 0.2 micron filters and took what passed through the filter and injected into a new chicken, that would cause a tumor a cell-free filtrate. Remember, the first definition of virus is cell-free filtrate. He showed that cancer could be caused by a viral infection. And he was actually the first to show this. A year earlier, two other investigators, who I mentioned at the beginning of this course, showed that leukemia could be caused by a virus. But at the time, people didn't think leukemias were tumors. They thought, you know, this is a big mass here, this sarcoma. That's a tumor. Leukemias, how can that be a tumor? But of course, they are tumors. They, their discovery will factor into this story in a moment. So he found that cancer could be caused by a viral infection. Well, nobody believed him. First of all, he was a newcomer to the cancer field. He wasn't even a virologist. No one believed him at all, which is the way science goes sometimes. 50 years later, though, he did get a Nobel Prize for this discovery. 50 years, the longest incubation period, as I've said before, for a Nobel Prize. He got it in 1966. So he went through a period where no one believed him. They thought he was wacky. Nobody could repeat his discovery. And then slowly evidence emerged that he was right. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about this today. What the cool thing is, so he just, his virus was called RSV, Rouse sarcoma virus. You can guess where the name came from. This turns out was worked on by many, many other people. And two more Nobel Prizes were given for work on Rouse sarcoma virus. So three Nobel Prizes from this chicken basically. I used to tell this story myself, but a couple of years ago, a wonderful book was written that tells it way better than I can. I'm not going to read you the book now, but I'm going to quote you some passages from it. This is the Emperor of All Maladies, Siddhartha Mukherjee, who's a professor at the, he's an oncologist at the medical center where I work, and he got a Pulitzer Prize for this. Anyone read, read it? The writing is beautiful. It will, if, if you don't care about viruses, this will send shivers up and down your spine, okay? His writing is gorgeous, I'm very jealous. So here's a quote, by 1950s, cancer researchers had split into three feuding camps, the virologist, 
led by Rouse, claimed that viruses cause cancer, though no such virus had been found in human studies. Epidemiologists argued that chemicals caused cancer, although they could not offer a mechanistic explanation. The third camp possessed weak circumstantial evidence that genes internal to the cell might cause cancer. They were all right, and eventually it all comes together, as he puts it in this book. Now, Howard Temin plays a big role in this story. We've talked about him because he was one of the co-discoverers of I know you don't memorize names, and you shouldn't, but does anyone know what he co-discovered? Reverse transcriptase. Remember that enzyme? Anyway, 1951, a young guy uh, came, went to Caltech. He was going to go study fruit flies, but he didn't like that. And uh, <laughs> he decided to go work with Renato Dulbeco. Now, he was the person who developed the plaque assay for animal viruses. He was really very adventurous. When new things happened, he wanted to get on board. And one of the things Dilbeka was doing was growing cells in his laboratory, which very few people did in 1951. That was the year HeLa cells were isolated. Nobody could get anything but primary cells to grow well, and you didn't do a lot of experiments with them. But he was very adventurous, and he had cells growing in his lab, and Temin found out, and he came to use them. Now, you have to understand that up until this point, this virus could only be shown to be causing tumors in chickens, right? That's really hard to work on after a certain point. You can't figure out mechanisms. So Temin wanted to somehow make what he called cancer in a dish. Not really, but he wanted to study Rouse's effect in the dish. And eventually, after seven years, he did that. What did he do? He took the virus and he added it to a layer of normal cells. Dobeka was growing chicken cells in the laboratory. Easy to get. You take chick embryos out of eggs, take a fertilized chicken egg, crack it open, take the embryo out, chop it up, trypsinize it, put them in a dish, you have cells. He infected them with Rouse sarcoma virus. The infection incited them to grow uncontrollably. These are Mukherjee's words, forcing them to form tiny distorted heaps containing hundreds of cells that Temin called foci. The foci, he reasoned, represented cancer distilled into its essential elemental form, cells growing uncontrollably, unstoppably. Now, we know from what I've told you already, this is not cancer. These are transformed cells, but it's the beginning. And Temin was on the right track. He had made something in the lab that approximated the road to cancer. And here are pictures of avian cells transformed by Rouse sarcoma virus made not too long ago. Um, they make these foci. So remember, this is sort of like a plaque. You put a small amount of virus on the monolayer, and you get infections here and there. It infects cells. It spreads from cell to cell. And whereas lytic viruses would make a plaque, transforming viruses make foci, where these cells are transformed. They start to grow faster. They pile up. And you can see they're really different from the rest of the cells in the monolayer. Uh, you can see there are different morphologies. Here's a whole monolayer of them. These are different. These are round and refractile here. But you could actually titrate the virus stocks in terms of the foci the virus made on these monolayers. So uh, this gave Tamin the idea that this virus is somehow permanently changing the cell. It's transforming them. And that's where he got the idea that these RNA tumor viruses, by now we knew that they had RNA as a genome, he said, there's no way RNA can permanently change cells. So it must, this virus must be making a DNA copy. And he went on to discover reverse transcriptase. That's where the thinking came in the discovery of RT, because Rouse sarcoma virus, an RNA tumor virus, could, could cause permanent changes to cells resulting in these phenotypes. So he went on to discover reverse transcriptase and that whole family of retroviruses. So that's the RNA tumor virus part. We're also going to talk about DNA viruses that cause tumors. Uh, in 1962, uh, after infection with polyomaviruses like SV40, rare baby hamster kidney cells changed shape, kept growing. They were transformed. 1964, SV40 was shown to transform mouse cells. Swiss uh, 3T3 are mouse cells. You infect with SV40, you get transformation. Now in these cases, often many of the cells died, but a few foci remained that grew forever. They were transformed. They became immortal. So both RNA and DNA viruses were shown to be able to transform cells. How can a virus infection transform a cell? I've told you often that viruses kill cells, they're lytic, right? 
So clearly, cytopathic effects have to be reduced or eliminated, otherwise the, the cell will die. Transformation means living forever, so you can't live forever if you're dying. Bioreplication has to be reduced or eliminated. Transformed cells in general do not produce virus particles. And finally, the cell has to keep dividing. That's why they're immortal, because they can divide forever. I have a little bell here to remind me to ask you, <laughs> do any of these ring a bell? Does, it, does this ring a bell in terms of something we just said last time? It should, because this is what a persistent infection is. It has a lot of these properties, no cytopathic effects, silence genomes, and so forth. And as we're going to see today, transformed cells are a kind of persistent infection, although virus particles are never made. Uh, which of the following is not a property of transformed cells? Increased requirements for growth factors, immortality, loss of anchorage dependence, loss of contact inhibition, colony formation in semi-solid media, which is not a property of transformed cells. What is the answer? A, increased requirements is wrong. It should be decreased requirements for growth factors. All the others are right. Has increased is not right. Has actually less for reasons that we're going to see today, as I told you. So here's the route to understanding viral transformation and its relationship to cancer. And I've told you parts of this story already. I've told you about uh, the discovery of retroviruses, the in vitro studies with RSV of Temin. We're, we've, I've told you a little bit about DNA viruses and the fact that some of these can transform cells. Now at this time, all this time, of course, cancer biologists are studying cancer, trying to understand them. In the 60s and 70s, all three areas came together, the convergence, which where, from which we have today the unified theory of cell growth control. So starting with how viruses cause transformed cells, we now understand how cells divide. It's because of viruses. So we're going to go through this. And first, we're going to start with retroviruses. We're going to see uh, how this study got resolved here. And we've already talked about Rouse sarcoma virus. But let me tell you a little bit more about chickens. Avian leukosis virus, ALV, is in all chicken flocks in the world. Every chicken that you eat. These chickens have been infected with ALV. This was actually, this is a virus that causes leukemia. It was discovered to do so in 1908 by Ellerman and Bang a year before Rouse. Most chickens are infected with this virus a few, a few uh, months after hatching. So everybody else in the colony of chickens are infected, so they spread it. You know, the conditions are pretty tight in these chicken coops. They're all in one big area, so it's easy for them to spread infections. And uh, most of them are infected. Leukemia occurs in infected birds that as they age, about 3% of birds get leukemia. And um, I, I suspect those are, those are sick and they're taken from the flocks. 97% uh, of the birds have a transient viremia. They have an immune response to the virus and they don't get leukemia. So all birds are infected with this virus and, and most of them go on to be fine. As these birds age, so if you allow birds to age, not everyone does, not every farmer does. So the farmers that want eggs, they let them age, but often they're killed young for, for, food, for meat, for us to eat, of course. But if you let your chickens age, these infected birds develop other cancers. So if they hadn't had leukemia at the onset, they get other cancers as they age, including connective tissue tumors or sarcomas. That's the one that Rouse studies. And Rouse got one of these chickens that was a bit older, had a sarcoma, if you take virus from them, and you put it back in chickens, it doesn't cause leukemia, it causes a sarcoma. Take a virus out of the sarcoma, it causes sarcomas. If you take the avian leukosis virus early from a young chicken, it will cause leukemia in a new chicken. So Rouse's virus was from one of these sarcoma viruses. And the key here is that most of these viruses, you can go back, you can do this today, you could get sarcomas on chickens and get a virus out related to Rouse. Most of the, and this was done many, many times over the years by different people after Rouse, most of them are defective. They cannot replicate on their own. They're missing viral genes, and you'll see why in a minute. But Rouse's was not defective. Can you imagine the first person to isolate one of these sarcoma viruses? He, he got one that wasn't defective, that could replicate on its own. In other words, he could throw it into, uh, into new animals and it would replicate. The defective ones, you cannot do that. So how do these viruses, why does Rouse, but not Avian leukosis virus cause sarcomas. Well, this began to be studied 
uh, in the 60s and 70s, and people found out that the viral genomes for solid tumors were recombinant viruses. They didn't resemble the parental Rouse sarcoma virus, and in particular, a piece of the genome of ALV. So Rouse sarcoma virus is basically an ALV where a piece of the genome is replaced with a segment of host DNA. Chicken DNA replaces a part of the Rouse, of the avian leukosis virus genome. And so in most Rouse sarcoma viruses, it replaces a viral gene, so those viruses are defective, they can't replicate. In Rouse's virus, the cellular gene was added to the viral genome, so that his virus could still replicate and it could still cause a sarcoma in chickens. In 1976, two people working together, two scientists working at UCSF, Mike Bishop and Harold Varmus, identified the gene that had been picked up by Rouse sarcoma virus. And they called it an oncogene, VSARC, SARC for sarcoma virus. And they both got the Nobel Prize in 1989. Here they are here. I've had the, the pleasure to interview both of them separately in the two links. We did a TWIV 400 with Harold Varmus. And he told the story of how this was all discovered. I did an interview with Mike Bishop here. It's on YouTube. These, are, these people are brilliant. You know, if you have some time, listen to their brilliance. Now, Var Varmus was, a, of course, also a head of NIH for many years, and uh, now he's at Sloan Kettering. So they discovered that Rouse sarcoma virus picked up an oncogene. So that's our second Nobel Prize. The first was for reverse transcriptase, Temin in Baltimore, Rouse sarcoma virus, and um, now the second Nobel Prize for discovering the oncogene that this virus picked up. So that's the major insight into how this virus works. ALV-infected birds come down with a variety of tumors. These all contain retrovirus derived from ALV. Most of them are defective, not Rouse's. They're all different. And I say Rouse was lucky. His isolate was not defective. Now, if you go back to a chicken sarcoma and isolate viruses over and over, you will get different genes coming out. And in fact, you can do this with... Um, different tumors of animals, mice, hamsters, and so forth. And people have done this over the year. And each DNA segment picked up from the cell by these viruses have an, has a novel gene in it. And this was a gold mine for molecular oncology. And today, all the genes that are involved in cell growth control, we originally identified because we picked them up in these viruses, the RNA tumor viruses that are able to cause tumors in, in various animals, not just chickens. And here they are. So on, on the left, the avian transducing retroviruses. So here's avian leukosis virus at the top. Uh, that's a map of the viral RNA. Remember, the RNA has a cap. It has gag pole envelope genes and sequences at either ends that will eventually become LTRs in the proviral DNA. So that's the beginning virus. And all these other viruses were isolated from various chicken tumors or bird tumors. And they're all derived from ALV. So here's Rouse's virus. His is non-defective because, look, it's, there's Sark in red. That's a cellular gene that the virus has picked up. That's what gives it its ability to cause, to transform cells. We'll see how in a moment. But gag, pollen, envelope are all intact, so it's non-defective. But avian myeloblastosis virus, isolated from myeloblastosis tumors, has a MIB, and you know, these Oncogenes were named after the tumors that they were obtained from. So SARC from sarcoma, MIB from myeloblastosis. You can see it replaces part of the envelope gene. So this virus can't replicate, can't make an envelope. These are the glycoproteins of the virus. And other ones here, you can see uh, here's the MYC oncogene, MIL. They're all yes, got to like the yes oncogene. Um, uh, herbs, erythroblastosis, they're all replacing viral sequences. So these are all defective. Rouse was lucky. Isn't that amazing? The first person to do that happened to be lucky. You can do this also with uh, mammalian tumors. So here on the right, there are a bunch of retroviruses that will cause tumors in mammalian cells. The prototype is murine leukemia virus, which causes leukemia, just like avian leukosis virus in chickens. And the mice develop a variety of tumors. As, they, as MLV picks up uh, oncogenes from the cell, Able, moss, raf, fes, fim, cis, kit, ras, etc. See sarcomas. Um, these are and a leukemia here. 
So that's the way this works. All these different tumors are caused by retroviruses in birds and mammals picking up cellular genes, and that is what eventually transforms the cell. Now you may be thinking, why would a cellular gene, it's there in the cell, so why is a virus picking it up causing the cell to be transformed? Well, that's a good question, and that's something uh, that we're going to answer. Now, just a little explanation of defective versus non-defective retroviruses in case you don't understand it. Avian leukosis virus will replicate on its own. It has all the genes it needs. You put it in a cell, it replicates, it grows outcome virus particles. Ralph sarcoma will do the same thing. But a virus like avian myeloblastosis virus BA1, uh, if you isolate this from a tumor and put it in cells, it will not grow. It needs a helper virus. It needs, well, AL, ALV would be a good helper virus to provide the envelope gene for it to grow. And it, you could provide that by co-infecting cells, and some of the virus that come out would, of course, be uh, a, a, ALV, and, uh, AMV, and some would be ALV. And typically, these are missing envelope proteins, which get deleted during the capture uh, of the oncogene. So what is going on here? Remember, an obligate phase in the replication of RNA tumor viruses is integration into the genome. And that's pretty much a random event. So you can imagine that somehow the virus would replicate next to a gene involved in growth control. And if it picked up that gene, then it could transfer it to other cells and cause transformation in those cells. Because once it picked it up, the gene would no longer be regulated. So here's an example of what we think happens we have uh, our retrovirus at the top as double-stranded DNA. We've bypassed, we've gone through the reverse transcription. It's integrating uh, into host DNA, and some of the time it's going to integrate randomly into or near an oncogene. An oncogene is a cellular gene involved in growth control. Uh, and then uh, sometimes you'll make the right kind of uh, mRNA, but sometimes uh, LTRs get deleted by recombination. Now remember, the LTRs have a promoter and a terminator for RNA transcription. So the wild type viral RNA is made by a promoter in the left LTR, it stops at the right LTR. But if there happens to be a DNA recombination event that removes the right LTR, then the mRNA is going to extend into neighboring sequences. And if that's an oncogene, uh, the virus is eventually going to have the oncogene, which is shown red here in the virus particle. And so the next time uh, this virus infects the cell, it's going to introduce this oncogene by integration uh, into the DNA. It's not going to be regulated like it is in the cell. It will be overproduced, and it will cause transformation. These retroviruses are mutagenic. They sustain lots of mutations because RT is error-prone. And so there are other point mutations that arise in these oncogenes to make them even more potent at transforming uh, the cell. And so it's not only simply the picking up of a cell gene and producing its product uncontrollably, but also mutations in the gene occur, which uh, contribute to transformation. So now we know about 60 of these genes. I think the name oncogene is a little unfortunate because in us, that's not their function, right? They're not in us to cause cancer. Oncogenesis is the formation of cancer, but initially they were called oncogenes because they were isolated, they were taken from tumors by retroviruses and the name has stuck. Uh, the ones in the cells are called proto-oncogenes, which is a little bit of a, a, a give to not calling them cancer genes, but still not great. There are over 60 of them in our cells. They're all involved in controlling our cell growth. Cell growth is a highly regulated process in our cells and these genes are involved, they're highly regulated. When they get into a tumor virus, an RNA tumor virus, that regulation is gone. Uh, the normal cellular genes are abbreviated like this, C for cellular, uh, SARC, MYC, MOS, RAS, etc. And then uh, virus, retroviruses that get, pick up these genes in tumors, uh, they're called V-onks, V-SARC, V-MYC, V-MOS, RAS, etc. And again, these viral, the genes that the viruses pick up can be unmodified or they can be mutated compared to the cellular gene. So what do these genes do? These are the genes that were identified in transforming retroviruses. They're all part of a signaling pathway involved in the control of growth. And they start at the plasma membrane. First of all, <laughs> there are growth factors, extracellular growth factors, in serum, for example, that are 
that induce cell division, and the gene for one of those was picked up by a retrovirus called cis. These growth factors bind receptors on the cell surface, and they're encoded by genes picked up by retroviruses, herb, FIMS, KIT, RAS, SCA. Then there are protein kinases on the membrane that take, carry the signal from the growth factor receptors, so growth factors bind. They activate the receptors. The receptors activate the kinases. The kinases are also encoded by oncogenes. Uh, there are GTP transfer proteins like RAS that transfer the phosphate into other kinases, cytoplasmic kinases. These are also <laughs> oncogenes, cellular oncogenes. And then finally, uh, these uh, activate nuclear proteins, which are basically transcriptional regulators and cell cycle regulators. So at every step of this mitogenic pathway, mitogenic means you add a growth factor to the cell, it starts to divide. You have components that, when overproduced via a retrovirus, will cause cell transformation. And you could go through every step of this and really work it out. If you overproduce a RAS, right, it will initiate the signaling leading to cell division. If you overproduce the growth factor, if you overproduce the transcription factor, it will turn on the growth pathway and make the cells divide. So there are many may, ways that you can regulate cell growth, and RNA tumor viruses can pick up the genes involved in all, all of them. Remember, the original phenotype caused by these retroviruses in cultured cells, the thing that Temin figured out, what Rouse sarcoma could do to chicken cells, is transformation. And so these are the genes picked up by these retroviruses that will cause transformation of cells, uncontrolled cell growth. And that is what viruses do. This is RNA tumor viruses. We'll get to the DNA viruses uh, in a moment. So this is all about the cell cycle, which I introduced to you a long time ago. And I told you that DNA viruses have to regulate it. They have to get the cell cycle going. Because in most cells, cells are not dividing. But DNA viruses need to get the cells to divide so they can use the DNA synthetic apparatus. And here's the cell cycle. Uh, there is a G0 point, and that is where the proto-oncogenes feed into the cell cycle. The growth factor pathway feeds right here and starts the cell through mitosis into G1 and eventually to S, and then G2 and back to mitosis. So these genes, proto-oncogenes, identified by studying transforming retroviruses. We, they're also dominant oncogenes because you can put any of these genes into a cell, and it will make the cell enter mitosis. It turns on genes that are needed for the cells to divide. So the M part up here, mitosis. Any of these oncogenes, when overproduced in cells, will cause the cell to go through mitosis and the remainder of the cell cycle. So that's what these retroviruses do. They make the cell go around and around forever and ever. They immortalize the cells. They transform them. They grow forever. They accumulate mutations. And then that makes the cells uh, oncogenic. Now, retroviruses transform cells by three mechanisms. There's rapid tumor formation, like the one I've told you, Rouse sarcoma virus. And about two weeks after you inject the virus into a chicken, you will get a tumor. And that's because Rouse has a dominant oncogene in the genome. The protein is made when the virus replicates. The oncogene turns the cells into dividing cells. That's very quick. Some viruses, some tumor viruses, have intermediate kinetics of tumor formation like avian leukosis viruses, the ones that are in all chickens that cause leukemias, they take, they take months to cause leukemias. They don't have an oncogene, though. An oncogene is not the only way to cause a tumor, to cause transformation. These viruses rather uh, work by cis activation. They integrate next to an oncogene, and they turn it on which is just as good as picking up the oncogene, I suppose. Then we have viruses, retroviruses with slow kinetics. It takes years, like the human T cell leukemia viruses. There's no oncogene. It doesn't cause cis activation. But these viruses make regulatory proteins that activate cellular genes. And that, act that activation, in turn, causes transformation. So that's illustrated here, these three different categories of transformation, rapid, intermediate, and slow. The rapid, the virus picks up an oncogene. And when that virus infects the cell, the oncogene is produced, makes the cells divide. Cis-acting retroviruses integrate next to an oncogene. And the right to LTR, remember, has a promoter. That's why I told you this you know, two months ago, because it leads to this. That promoter is going to activate the oncogene. And finally, 
transactivating retroviruses, slow kinetics. They, these retroviruses encode a protein not found in the other genomes. It's called X here. It's a viral transcriptional activator. It's needed for the LTR to be activated efficiently. Uh, and these activators will work on cellular genes as well. And one of them uh, happens to be IL-2 and its receptor. It's a cytokine. Cytokines can make cells divide as well by binding to cell surface receptors. Now we can explain the exception to the rule that uh, viruses do not need to transform cells. I think retroviruses that transform cells as a mistake or byproduct of their life cycle. They have to integrate, and sometimes something goes wrong with the integration, as I've just told you three different ways, and that ends up transforming the cells. Doesn't, these viruses do not have to transform cells in order to reproduce, but there is a retrovirus called walleye dermal sarcoma virus. That's a walleye, and that's a tumor caused by this particular retrovirus. And it so happens that these fish get infected in the water, they develop a tumor, and then at a certain time of the year, I think it's the fall, the fish, they live quite close together in the water, the tumor falls off, the tumor is full of virus, and that's how the, the virus spreads to other fish. So without the tumor, the virus wouldn't be able to transmit to other fish. So here's an example of where tumor formation helps transmission of the virus. But uh, this is a non-defective virus, as you might guess. The other viruses I will talk to you about, they're non-defective, so they can't be transmitted in tumors. And it remains true that for, for the avian and mammalian retroviruses I've told you about, transformation is an accident of the way they happen to replicate. Which of the following allows Rouse sarcoma virus to transform cells? Presence of the envelope gene, presence of a Paul gene, presence of a SARC gene, presence of LTRs, none of the above. The answer is C, presence of a SARC gene. It's the best answer. So I, I understand why some of you might have said LTRs, but Rouse sarcoma virus specifically picks up a SARC gene. So the LTR itself is not the main driver. If I had said, um, you know, avian leukosis virus, then it would have been the LTR. All right, let's look at DNA tumor viruses. Here, they're part of our scheme here in the 1920s. They were discovered uh, in vitro studies showed they could transform cells. How did the convergence happen? All right, anybody ever hear of a jackalope? You must have. It's this internet thing that if you, if you search jackalope, you will find people with pictures of rabbits that look like this, it's supposed to be a hybrid between an, a, a jackrabbit and an antelope. Well, it's a mythical creature, it doesn't exist. What they are are rabbits with papillomas, tumors on their heads. So here's one here. Now you can see that maybe off in the distance, someone seeing this can't see too well. Look at that jackalope. And here, this one. Now, these are harmless tumors. They're caused by papillomaviruses. They fall off and the animals are fine. They, they look a little nasty, but um, they, they don't hurt these animals. They were first discovered uh, in cottontail rabbits by Richard Shope back in 1933. So this virus was discovered uh, in 1933. Uh, polyomaviruses, so papillomas, a separate family of polyomaviruses like SV40, were discovered later. Murine polyomaviruses, 1953, uh, that caused rare tumors under certain conditions. So these are mouse viruses. You can find them in wild mice everywhere. You catch a wild mice, you can, found, you can find a mouse polyomavirus. It doesn't cause tumors in them at all. But if you infect the wrong species with this virus, like a hamster, a rat, or a rabbit, it will cause tumors in the wrong species. Should give you a hint. In the right species, it replicates, it kills cells, no tumors. In the wrong species, something is going on. Uh, another one, polyomaviruses, SV40, continuing with the polyoma. Back in 1962, SV40 was discovered as a contaminant of early poliovirus vaccines, which were prepared in monkey kidney cells. So SV, simian virus 40, came from monkey kidney cells. Several million Americans were infected with SV40 as they got their polio uh, vaccine. I guess I did, because I got vaccinated in 55 or 6, and then again in 61, so I probably had SV40. How would you find out if I got infected with SV40, by the way? What would you do? 
ELISA. What, what stuff for me are you going to do an ELISA on? Yes, take, an, take serum. Very easy to do. I don't want you to biopsy anything. Most people are not going to let you do that. But serum is easy. And then you can do an immunological assay. Look for antibodies. Would you look for IgM? No. No, they're going to be long gone. IgG for sure. So they do this, and they can find these people who are infected. And for a long time, people were claiming, lawyers were claiming that this caused tumors of certain types, but probably not. Anyway, the uh, host of this virus is the monkey. It doesn't cause tumors then. And it doesn't transform monkey cells in culture. But if you infect hamsters, which is not the right host, this virus will cause tumors in hamsters. Beginning to get the picture. Here is a summary of what I've told you. We have SV40 permissive in monkey cells. Mouse polyoma is not permissive in monkeys. Uh, we have a, in mice, SV40 is not permissive. Mouse polyoma virus, of course, is permissive uh, in mice. If you take a hamster and infect it with uh, SV40, or mouse polyoma virus, these are semi-permissive conditions, and you will get tumors. If you take a rat and infect it with either SV40 or mouse polyoma virus, it's semi-permissive, you get tumors. So if it's permissive, you don't get tumors. If it's non-permissive, which means the virus doesn't replicate at all, it doesn't make tumors, only when it's semi-permissive. What does semi-permissive mean? The viral DNA gets in and goes so far into the, you get early mRNAs made, but the viral DNA doesn't replicate. Early mRNAs are made. I bet you know what's encoded by the first mRNA that comes off a polyomavirus genome, right? Now the other aspect of this story, so we have to infect the wrong host in order to get these DNA tumor viruses to cause transformation. The other aspect is that it's rare. One transformed cell per 100,000 cells. If you do it in culture, you know, you take SV40 and infect rat cells in culture, you're going to get rare transformed foci. Why is it so rare? And what does it have to do with tumor formation in animals? Remember, the animal, we're looking for tumors. But in cells, we can look for transformation, which is an earlier result. One more virus, adenovirus. These viruses that cause, in humans, respiratory and gastrointestinal and eye infections. Well, there are many serotypes, but none of them cause tumors in humans. But some of them will cause tumors in other animals, the wrong host, hamsters, 12 to 18 or 7 to 11. So just like polyomaviruses, these viruses can cause tumors. They can transform cells in culture. And it's pretty rare events, and it has to be the wrong animal that's infected. So there's a common theme arising here. What does all this mean? Well, people were a little confused until this key finding, which brings us back to our favorite protein T antigen. T antigen was originally caused, called T antigen because it was identified in tumors caused by these viruses in the wrong host. You know, it wasn't originally found because it is a transcriptional activator. It's important for DNA synthesis. It was just a protein, a virus protein found in tumors. And that's why it got called T antigen. So SV40 encodes T antigens, as you know, polyomaviruses, different sizes. Papillomaviruses, they're encoded by these genes, E567, and adenoviruses, E1A and B, encode T antigens. They're all present in tumors and animals caused by these viruses or in transformed cells. And they're all different proteins. SV40 T antigen doesn't look anything like E1A of adenovirus or polyoma or papillomavirus T antigens. They're all different proteins, but they're all found in tumors. And remember, T antigens are, are essential, encoded by essential viral genes. They're needed for replication. Remember, uh, in SV40, they recruit the DNA synthetic apparatus. They help de denature the origin of replication. Then they bring in the DNA polymerase. They're also transcriptional activators, essential for viral DNA synthesis. And guess what? In tumor cells from animals or transformed cells in culture, those are the only viral genes that are always found in those conditions. And in fact, you can now take T antigen alone from any of these viruses. You can take its gene on a plasmid. You can put that plasmid into cells, and it will transform them. It's a great way to make immortal cells. So I could take a little cheek cells from myself, put them in culture. Remember, they're going to die after 20 divisions. But if I put T antigen into them from any of these viruses, SV40, polyomas, papillomas, adeno, it will transform the cells, make them be immortal. So T antigen is all that you need. 
So these all seem to be unrelated discoveries, virus biology, cell cycle transformation. People didn't really understand uh, what was going on. And then these three discoveries were made, which really sealed what was going on. First of all, uh, someone discovered T antigen of SP40 binds a cell protein, which was called P53. It's a 53 kilodalton cell protein. Secondly, transcription of early genes of adenovirus, the E2 genes, which I've told you before, requires a cell protein called E2F. It's a transcription factor. Now it's known to be a family of proteins called the E2F family. And finally, E2F was found to bind a cell protein called the retinoblastoma protein. Remember, this is a, uh, encoded by a gene that's deleted in kids that develop retinal tumors. And this gene product binds uh, E2F. These proteins, P53, RB, and E2F, are subsequently found to be critical players in controlling the cell cycle. So let's go back to the cell cycle again. Remember, we have my, a phase of mitosis where the cells actually split apart. After the cells uh, divide, there's one period of cell growth called G1. Then there's the S phase where DNA replicates. And once the DNA is replicated, then the cells can divide. You can stimulate cells to divide by that series of oncoproteins that we talked about, identified by the RNA tumor viruses, or simply by adding growth factors to cells, some of which are, in fact, encoded by oncoproteins. And so this is the cycle controlled by uh, the oncogenes we've discussed, but this cell cycle is also controlled by P53 and RB. So remember, the proto-oncogenes control whether the cell is going to go through the mitotic uh, phase of the cell cycle. There's another checkpoint down here in G1, which will control whether the S phase uh, is, is entered in cells. S is the synthetic phase where DNA replication begins. So if we have nutrients initiating the mitogenic cycle, we go through mitosis, there's another checkpoint here that the cell has to go through before it will duplicate uh, its DNA. And remember, these proto-oncogenes, mitogenic signals, were all discovered as oncogenes carried by transforming retroviruses. The second restriction point is down here in G1. It is regulated by RB. So in other words, even if you get a signal to go through mitosis, RB samples the environment to make sure if conditions are right in order to make DNA, in order to go through the synthetic phase. And kids who develop retinoblastoma, they have a deletion of both copies of the RB gene. In other words, there's no restriction point. So the cells keep dividing in their retinas, and that's where the tumor arises. Transformation, uncontrolled division, retinal tumor. That's what clued us into this RB protein, which is an important restriction point on moderating the cell cycle. This is a recessive oncogene. So that's the retinoblastoma protein. You need to delete both copies uh, in order to abrogate this restriction point. So what does uh, RB do? And we've talked a little bit about RB before, so this will be a bit of a review. So on the left, we have the plasma membrane of a cell. There are growth factor receptors sitting in the plasma membrane, and their job is to sense when there are growth factors present in the medium so that the cell will divide or not. So if you add a ligand, it can be present in serum, for example, it will bind to the receptor, and these are uh, protein kinases typically. The ligands are encoded by oncogenes themselves. Remember, you can overproduce them and make cells divide uncontrollably. Binding of a ligand initiates a phosphorylation cascade that eventually alters gene expression in the nucleus. And one of the results of that is phosphorylation of RB, which eventually leads to the G1S transition. So that restriction point here in G1 can be bypassed when RB protein is phosphorylated. I explained this to you before, but let's go through it again. RB normally is bound to E2F and another protein called DP123. That complex recruits histones, deacetylases, which deacetylate chromatin and shut it off. And what is being shut off? Well, the genes that you need for DNA synthesis and eventually mitosis. So those are controlled by RB and E2F. 
So normally cells do not divide, they do not enter DNA synthesis because RB is bound up with E2F and it's silencing the promoters of genes that are needed for cell division and DNA synthesis. When there are nutrients present in the medium, the signaling phosphorylates RB, then RB is released from E2F. E2F can go on, E2F is a transcription factor which will then go on and activate genes involved in DNA synthesis. So we will pass through the S phase. And at the same time, the histone deacetylase is removed from the promoters and it, it allows the genes to be transcribed by loosening them up. So that's how RB acts as a checkpoint protein. It determines whether genes are gonna be transcribed or not that are involved in DNA synthesis. And here you can see the combination of oncogenes. Every step of this way here, you can tell by the names, Schick, Gerb, RAS, these are all oncogenes. They were all identified in RNA tumor viruses. They're part of the signaling cascade. You have a growth factor in the medium leads to phosphorylation of RB. The growth factor in the medium will lead to mitosis by degrading this particular factor. But then unless RB is phosphorylated, you will not go through DNA synthesis. So that's how the cell cycle is controlled. Now DNA viruses, of course, want cells in this S phase. They need cells to be dividing to get polymerases and accessory factors, which I've told you before. And that's what the T antigens do. They kick cells into S phase. So in a cell producing a T antigen, whether it be from SV40 polyoma, uh, papilloma, adeno, it bypasses this restriction point and makes the cells go into S phase and around and around and around. And of course, eventually they will replicate very well and kill those cells, so they won't become transformed. So here's what T antigens do. Here is RB bound to E2F, recruiting histone deacetylase to promoters to shut them down so we can't get mitosis. E1A, large T, E7, these are the T antigens of uh, adenovirus, SV40, papillomaviruses. They uh, sequester RB and take it away from E2F so that E2F can then go on and activate genes involved in DNA synthesis and ultimately mitosis. We talked about this before because remember adenovirus transcription requires the E2F proteins and they're normally bound up by RB. So adenovirus E1A bumps uh, RB off so that the E2F proteins are liberated to activate its promoters and at the same time that activates DNA synthesis so that the virus has uh, DNA polymerase and accessory factors to work with. So we've talked about this restriction point in the cell cycle mediated by RB. There's one other checkpoint, and that is if there's unscheduled DNA replication in cells or DNA damage, there's a protein that detects that. It's called P53. Remember, that was the one discovered to bind to T antigens. P53's job is to say, is, is DNA replicating? And if so, is it cellular DNA or is it something that's not supposed to be happening? Or if there's some DNA damage, uh, that will also be detected by P53. And what, what happens is if, if, DNA, if P53 senses through a variety of intermediate proteins, which we don't need to go into, DNA damage or unscheduled DNA synthesis, P53 binds to promoters that activate cell cycle arrest and, and program cell death. So basically, P50C says, nope, you are not replicating, you are dying, and that's the end of the virus infection. So you must be thinking, well, viruses have to counter P53, right? Absolutely. That's why T antigens are binding P53 as well. Because even if they can, even if these viruses can kick the cells into DNA synthesis, P53 would halt it. So they've got to get over RB and P53. So here's how they do P53. So here is P53 right here in the middle. It's a tetramer of the four colored spheres. And the various T antigens do different things. SV40 large T binds P53 and sequesters it. So it cannot activate promoters that activate cell death. Uh, the, the E6 protein or T antigen of papillomaviruses binds to P53 and causes it to be ubiquitinated and degraded by the proteasome. Same thing uh, with the E1B protein of uh, adenovirus. It binds um, uh, the, the uh, P53, gets it ubiquitinated, and has it degraded as well. 
So these viral proteins all have to not only counter RB, as I've showed you before, they also have to counter P53. And that's why people found these proteins to be binding to both RB uh, and P53. T antigens are encoded by viral genes that are essential for replication, present in tumors and transformed cells, encoded by viral genes that have been incorporated into the cell genome, antagonists of cell cycle checkpoint proteins, all of the above. The answer, of course, is E, all of the above. Every one of those is a characteristic of T antigen. All right, so you understand so far about T antigens, how they abrogate P53 and RB. Two more things we have to solve. Uh, first of all, why are all viral genes except T antigen genes deleted or turned off in cells transformed with these viruses? And why is transformation so rare? And it's rare because there are two low probability events that have to occur. First, the late genes must not be expressed. Remember, late genes encode the capsid proteins. This would assemble a virus particle and cause the cell to break open and release them. So they're lethal. And so transformation requires rare spontaneous deletion of these late genes. It's pretty rare for an incoming DNA to get deleted, so you lose those. And so that's one reason why uh, transformation is rare. And that's why semi-permissive cells are so easily transformed and the wrong animal is so easily uh, transformed to form a tumor because you don't get late gene expression. Remember I said a semi-permissive infection is where the virus comes in, you get early gene expression, and then late gene expression doesn't occur, probably because something is missing in the non-permissive host, some factor that's required. So you don't get late gene expression, that preserves the cells so they live, and that happens in either the wrong host or if you're in the right host, it's really rare. And finally, the other rare event is that T antigen has to be on all the time and it has to be transmitted to every cell that divides. So in other words, T antigen DNA has to integrate into the host cell DNA. And that's a pretty rare event also for that to happen. So these two together, deletion of late genes, integration of T antigen have to occur and that's why transformation is so rare. And that's really why these uh, occurrences, transformation and tumor formation are what I call abnormal epigenetic processes for these DNA tumor viruses in quotes, because in the right host, they don't cause tumors. The SV40s, the papillomas, the polyomas usually don't cause tumors in the right host. But uh, under the right conditions where we modulate their lytic potential by shutting off late genes and cause T antigens to be produced in every cell by integrating them, then they can transform the cells. They're not required for the normal viral life cycle. They're accidents, right? So in the wrong host, well, how often would a, would a virus infect the wrong host? Probably not ever in nature. We're doing that in the laboratory as a way of understanding how these uh, viruses can transform cells. So we don't need it for replication or transmission. We do now understand that in the right host, some transformations can occur. So human papillomaviruses are human viruses that cause uh, warts in us. And under certain conditions, uh, these rare events can occur. Loss of late genes and integration of the T antigens of papillomaviruses. And that's what can cause uh, the tumors uh, by this virus. And it's really interesting that Henrietta Lacks, from whom HeLa cells were derived, was infected with human papillomavirus. It integrated into her genome such that only the T antigens were produced. The late lytic genes were all deleted, and that's what caused her tumor, and that's where we got HeLa cells. And how do we know this? Because we can sequence the HeLa cell genome and see HPV-18 T antigens sitting there right in her genome, and that's what caused her tumor, and that's why HeLa cells are immortal. Now, you can delete that T antigen gene from HeLa cells, and after 20 divisions, they die. They lose their immortality. It's an interesting circle uh, of events. But remember, none of these events are really needed for virus replication. Even HPV uh, formation of tumors in people is not needed for virus replication. It's a side event. It's an accident of the life cycle, which happens to be has the, all these viruses encoded T antigen to kick the cells into DNA synthesis. And they need that for their replication, but if it gets expressed incorrectly, it causes a tumor. So DNA tumor viruses have to start the cell cycle. 
T antigens uh, turn on the G to S phase by inactivating RB, and then they have to inactivate P53 to block apoptosis. These viruses need to do this to be able to replicate. But if these proteins, these amazingly powerful proteins, these T antigens are expressed on their own, then you have transformation. And of course, that in itself is not enough to be a tumor. These cells have to replicate quite a number of times to accumulate the number of mutations needed to form cancer cells. They're on their way to becoming cancer cells, but they are not. So this whole cell cycle, you know, we've known about the cell cycle for many years, but exactly how it's controlled, revealed by the study of RNA and DNA tumor viruses. That's why I think this story is so remarkable. Not that we understand how transformation occurs and how it leads to tumor formation, but that we sorted out the whole pathway by using viruses. And really, in the end, that is their power. They allow you to have insights which you can't get otherwise. So we understand that the proto-oncogenes that allow cells to go through mitosis, that whole pathway from the, from the soluble receptors to the nucleus, that was revealed by studying the transforming retroviruses that encode dominant oncogenes. This checkpoint here was revealed by the, the fact that there are tumor suppressor genes that block it. If you take them away, the cells divide uncontrollably. That was revealed by studying the recessive oncogenes uh, of DNA tumor viruses. So this whole regulation of the cell cycle, we understand from viruses. But more remarkably, what I think is amazing, all of this started with a chicken. <laughs>